This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. K-State livestock economist Ted Schroeder and his graduate student Katie Domit start the show discussing their recent research on trends for beef premiums and discounts. Continuing the show is K-State beef specialist Sandy Johnson as she shares about technology in the cattle industry. There are many products that are widely used and more that are still entering the market. K-State horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd concludes today's show with an update on several insect pests, including blister beetles, fall webworm, and cicada killers. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Thursday show discussing some recent work from Kansas State University's Agricultural Economics Department. And then to talk about their research, we have K-State livestock economist Ted Schroeder, and we are also joined by his graduate student in agricultural economics, Katie Domit. Ted, Katie, thank you both so much for taking the time to join us today. Our pleasure. And Ted, to my understanding, what you and Katie have been looking into is grid pricing and how it has impacted the cattle market. And so kind of before we jump in and see what that impact has been, can you give us kind of a preview of how this research came about? Yeah, so grid pricing has evolved over time and it's been around for quite a while. But it refers to valuing fed cattle based upon the individual attributes of the pens of cattle. And so think of quality grade, yield grade, other maybe special breed characteristics, weights of the cattle, those kinds of things that ultimately are related to end user consumer valuation preferences. And the whole idea behind grid pricing is that if you can get better pricing value signals, that customers and consumers want down to producers, it can incentivize producers to produce things, produce the kind of quality cattle that are in demand and avoid or reduce production of attributes that are in less demand. And so grid pricing, like I say, has been around for a while, being used in the industry more and more. And what we've seen over the last decade or so is a rapid increase actually in the industry overall to adoption and use of grid pricing systems in fed cattle at the feedlot level. And a big part of that is because producers have recognized they can actually make more money, be more profitable, if they can, as they can produce cattle that match up well with the grids that are, that are available to them. The important thing about the advancement of that is it is also increased consumer demand for high quality beef because the demand is there and now the industry is is able to provide more of that through the grid pricing system. The flip side of that or the challenge of that is as we have adopted more grid pricing, the grids themselves, the price signals, the premiums and discounts that are out there, they vary quite a bit. And that was really one of the major I guess, motives behind doing this study is to kind of update where are we at with those premiums and discounts and kind of what are the implications of those premiums and discount trends, but also variation in them as as producers consider either renegotiating their current relationship or even adopting a, a grid pricing system. So Katie, how did you go about kind of setting up prepping to do this research? Yeah, so um, I think the kind of the driving force of the purpose of this project was to kind of look at the big picture and quantify those impacts of premiums and discounts in a way that producers can look at and analyze and implement on, on their own farms and production in their operations to ensure that they can get the highest profit for their quality of cattle. So we took data from the United States Department of Agriculture and the Livestock Marketing Information Center and analyzed some of those different premiums and discounts offered for the different attributes, looked at some of the relationships between boxed beef prices and the premiums given for different quality grades. And that was kind of the baseline of the project um, behind the driving force of the increase in use of formula pricing and how that has helped producers see the value kind of come full force in turning around the profits for their operation. 
So how have times changed to kind of what our current trend is? Well, one of the things that's really important, again, for those that are, like I said, either negotiating, again, their renewed formula contract relationship with grids affiliated with that, which a lot of producers do. A lot of these contracts are renegotiated annually and, and, and reestablished. And part of that negotiation is what is the grid itself going to look like for my cattle? How are we going to establish premiums for choice and premiums for, for prime and, and discounts for, uh, for yield grade fours and those kinds of things? And all of these characteristics of the cattle, of course, are interrelated. You can't look at one independent of the other. What we were doing and what Katie especially was diving into here was saying, what kind of variation are we seeing across different grids in USDA reported data on those premiums and discounts? And and what is quite revealing here is there is a lot of variation in the premiums and discounts that are available to producers across grids. It It really, you know... 20 years ago when we were first starting grid pricing, we were sort of out there trying to figure out where are these premiums and discounts going to land and and how are we going to figure out those valuations. And there was a lot of variation in them. We're finding today there's still a lot of variation across grids. And part of the reason for that is different end users have different preferences. And so different grid programs that even the same packer might have quite different premiums and discounts. While some of the premiums and discounts for more typical relations like choice uh, relative to select, that's pretty strongly related to wholesale valuations. But as you start to get into more specialty components of of grid pricing, breed programs, those kinds of things, the premiums and discounts can vary quite a bit, enough that it is well worth familiarizing the variation there. And if I'm I'm in a negotiation, I want to be armed with what are – the grid premiums and discounts that are out there and are mine in line with the market and with others that are out there? And uh, can I, as a producer, match my cattle to the best grid that, that's available to me? So it, it's it's really about going out and figuring out how my cattle are going to perform under those different grids. And it's not a, oh, I'm on a grid, I'm done. It's which grid am I on? And how do my cattle match up? Because there's quite a bit of variation in those premiums and discounts. So really could have a pretty big impact then for cattle producers. Enough that it's well worth spending the time every, you know, even not during just renegotiation. I want to kind of always monitor. I'm always judging and, and assessing how my cattle valuation compares to what the rest of the, uh, of the cattle available in the market are receiving and when you have a premium discount structure that has variation, you, you have to be aware of where the ranges are and, and kind of where the typical valuation differences could be under different grid options. So it is important. It, it, it can affect profitability for sure to, to not only be in the grid, but also figure out which grid options and opportunities match best with your cattle. Is there a trend now that you're seeing that has kind of continued to push forward? Indeed, there is. The the high-quality premiums, it, it has to do with specialty breed programs, with upper-choice grade, with even prime-grade beef, has been incredibly resilient uh, and, and growing for, for the last several years. And even in, in times that we're facing with, with inflation and economic challenges on a, on a macro level and even on an individual consumer level, we still see strong, growing demand for high-quality beef. That bodes well for grid pricing because you want those signals for the valuation that consumers are are preferring and and demanding to get back to the producer. It is a win-win. As the consumer gets more of what they want in the high-quality, desirable eating experience product and gets those pricing signals back to the producer through grid pricing systems, that signals information back to feeder cattle producers and cow-calf. It flows throughout the entire beef chain. So this is, to me, you know, it's a perfect or, you know, a great way for a a vertical market to coordinate what the consumer wants with what the producer can, can produce profitably. And Katie, from this work, were there any interesting things you found within it? For me, this was really my first bigger research project. So it was just interesting for me to see the quantification of the big picture story kind of come to life. 
and see some of those historical trends and how they're continuing to increase related to beef pricing and, and premiums and discounts and really understand kind of the background behind it, but also as a producer, understand how I can maximize profit on our family's farm and ho- hopefully help um, other producers in that as well. But yeah, just really, I guess my biggest takeaway was seeing the bigger picture story of it really come to life with the data and quantifying those relationships between a lot of the different factors involved in this project. And you mentioned you're a producer with your family. And so for producers who are looking into grid pricing, kind of what's that first step you recommend they take? I think awareness is really important. Just being aware of the opportunities that are out there for you and different options and opportunities at different packers and really being able to look at the different prices that you can receive and kind of pick and choose what's best for your operation to maximize your profit for your animals. Because everyone has different animals. Everyone's focuses are in different areas. So as long as you have the background knowledge to really understand where you can focus your efforts to maximize your profit, I think that's the most important is really having that, the background knowledge and being able to see the bigger picture. If people are wanting to read your guys' work, where can they do that? So the work that we've discussed today is on our agmanager.info website uh, in, a, in a fact sheet that documents and details all the data analysis that Katie has, has shared with us. That was K-State livestock economist Ted Schroeder, and he was joined by his graduate student in agricultural economics, Katie Domit. You can read their work by going to agmanager.info, and it's titled Fed Cattle and Beef Premiums and Discounts, Trends and Implications. I will link it in today's show notes, which you can find on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but we'll be back with more. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Thursday show now discussing technology that could be seen in the beef industry right now. And to talk about it, we're joined by K-State Extension Beef Specialist, Sandy Johnson. Sandy, thanks for joining us today. You bet. Glad to be here. So getting to talk about some fun things and some exciting technology in the beef industry and kind of just in agriculture in general. But first, taking a step back and kind of talking about technologies that we're seeing more integrated already into the industry. One of the technologies that we have probably talked about for a lot of reasons uh, related to animal ID is radio frequency identification tags. And, you know, there's lots of those being used uh, in the industry today, you know, to simplify that identification process. And that's often the base for many of these other technologies we'll talk about, although there are certainly other other types as well. But the ability for an animal to walk by something or send a signal back to a, a satellite or whatever that this is who I am serves as a basis because when you think about collecting animal information, we're trying to get it back to an individual animal to uh, help us manage that animal better. And Sandy, our conversation is focused a little bit more towards the beef and cattle industry. However, these technologies go across many industries and many species. And one of those technologies is cameras. Right. We see lots of cameras these days from driving down the road. And and I think uh, I can list a number of producers I know that have installed them in calving and lambing barns to to keep track of things. And so our ability to have cameras in different places and in our phones has has changed a lot. And, you know, even if we're talking about technology, just our ability to use that camera in your phone to like document, maybe it was an animal that died and you take a picture of the ear tag and, you know, you got a date and a timestamp. That's technology to me that's really helped our industry or you're going after a park to town and you take a picture of what it was. And, you know, cameras have tremendous value to us, I think. And and we're seeing that more and more with, you know, various advanced animal management technology as well. And you shared some of this in a recent article in the Beef Tips newsletter. And you shared an example in there about the dairy industry and using this technology on operations. Dairies are managed much more intensively than our, our beef cattle are in general. And so they've really been taking advantage of this technology for a long time. And, you know, the type of things they're doing now, and it might be a a leg band or a collar, and it has, uh, might have an accelerometer on there. So, you know, if they're standing up or sitting down, 
and they associate that movement if they're in heat or not. And so uh, this uh, device is collecting this information, and that may include rumination. If they're not ruminating enough, that might indicate illness. And so, you know, they get a feed on all these individual animals on, you know, what their stats are for these various things that they're measuring. Times resting, standing, ruminating, activity. And using that then, as those cows go to the milking parlor, their tag is read in. And if they need to be sorted off to start a synchronization protocol or have a sample taken to see if they're pregnant, a lot of these dairies are doing on-farm blood or milk pregnancy test on a, on an early test. And so then, you know, when they leave the parlor, they're sorted off for that to be bred, to be bled, whatever it is. And that's all automated. You know, they, they go through essentially a, a shoot, but the shoot purpose is to read that animal and then open a gate that either lets them go back to the pen or off here or there for whatever special uh, needs they might have. And you know, you just think about if you're milking a thousand dairy cows and you don't have to have some person there making that sort, that's quite a, a labor saving. And so, you know, they're really making, taking advantage of it in the dairy industry. And of course, on our beef side, we're, we're not nearly as intensive, but we can still apply some of those things if we choose to intensify some of the things we're doing, even if it's only for a short period of time. When thinking about then how to reduce labor needs and labor cost, how can cameras on unmanned aerial devices support that? There's a number of ways, and I don't remember if we mentioned, uh, I, I guess, in passing reference to calving, you know, make, paying attention there. Uh, but they're also working on using them to count animals in a feedlot. I had a cousin that used to hang out of an airplane and take pictures, and he was measuring collateral for a bank. And uh, I don't know if then he had to go home and count each animal. I'm not sure, but I know that's what he was doing. So so we can use drones for that. They're also using it, starting to use them in the feedlot to uh, see what's happening in that feed bunk. If we're trying to work cattle up on feed and we take an image of that feed bunk at, say, 10 o'clock at night, still quite a bit of feed there, but say by midnight, it's slicked. That's one pin. And the next pin their feed bunk, say, isn't slick till four in the morning. Each of those pins is a slightly different place if we're working them up on feed. And so while the idea of trying to have somebody check bunks that frequently during the night or during the day uh, just would, would probably be beyond most operations management, if we could automate that with a, a drone and then we have this, the technology that takes that image that says, yeah, there's a lot of feed there, a little feed there. You know, so it's not like somebody actually looking at each photo. Somehow that's automated through image capture. And no, I can't explain that, but those types of things are being done. That can be very valuable in those settings. Sandy, we've talked about some technology that producers may be seeing on operations across the country or in their home county. However, there are some other ones that are slowly integrating their way into the industry. Yeah, you know, at one of our KSU KLA field days this summer, there mush rushes. We talked about uh, virtual fencing. So there are producers, beef producers in the U.S. that are, are working with that. And that's, of course, more extensive operations generally. But we have to kind of train animals to recognize that fence. And um, then depending on the location, you know, if your operation is close to uh, Wi-Fi or some other good internet connection, that makes things much simpler. You know, you've got a, a repeater or something close by your main operation, but in other cases, it becomes a little more involved to set up um, what's needed to read those tags at, at distance. There is one particular company that has their, you know, it's a GPS unit that's going to track them, but also, you know, signal the animal when they're you know, if they cross the fence, they're going to get scolded. But it has a, essentially a solar panel in the side of this tag. And it's fairly good size, and it's actually a collar. But, you know, depending on how much data you're trying to collect and how frequent and how far away you've got to send this, uh, you need uh, a battery in some cases. And and so one of the ways is, is solar powered. And I'll be curious to see how that, you know, works out over time. But there's just lots of things that, that people are trying with 
combining these various technologies to essentially herd cattle where we want them. And, you know, of course, the other thing that we didn't quite talk about with um, the drone approach is is monitoring what the water tank looks like. And that could be actually a fixed camera that's over the water tank or the windmill, or it could be a drone application. But but either way, if, if we didn't have to go out there and look to make sure there was water, that can save us some time. Although we know that Often when we go out and look to see if there's water, we're also uh, looking at other things and, you know, is this calf looking a little droopy-eared or, you know, something like that. We, I'm not sure we've eliminated the need to physically go out there at all times, but it still can be very helpful to have that additional eyes, so to speak. And Sandy, as we wrap up today's conversation, what's some of your favorite technology and kind of what do you hope to see in the future? Well, since I'm a reproductive physiologist, I'm really kind of jealous of what the dairy industry is able to do just in terms of, you know, tracking animals and and data. I'm not sure that we need that on the beef side, but I I appreciate what what they're able to do there. And and that, I guess, is intriguing to me because we tend to keep less records on the beef side. And I just feel like oh, I'm jealous. I wish we could analyze our operations that closely and, and use that to improve. But this type of technology that might help us manage individual animals better, I think the more information you have, you recognize the importance of knowing more about your animals. Okay. And so I've always felt like if we had the, whether it's time or want to, to track our beef operations better. In some cases, we could do a better job of managing and and maybe improve our profitability. And so, because I'm interested in beef producers' profitability, that has always been a, a goal of mine. How can we help these producers do that better? So I think there's some tools here that might help us do that. And, you know, I think they've got a long way t- to go from a you know, everybody's going to use them standpoint. But, you know, there's just all kinds of things you could think about that you might make work uh, with the opportunities that are out there now. So that's fun to think about, too, is, well, what else could we do with this? That was Kansas State University Beef Extension Specialist Sandy Johnson. You can read more on this topic by going to her article titled Technology in Beef Production Systems. This article was included in KSU Beef's Beef Tips newsletter, which you can sign up for on ksubeef.org. I will have a link to her article and a way to sign up to the Beef Tips newsletter in today's show notes, which, as always, you can find on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. If you're concerned about fall webworm, K-State horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd says this time of year, feeding by fall webworm caterpillars is not directly harmful to trees, especially larger trees. This week he discusses managing fall webworm infestations, cicada killers, cleaning up the home landscape, and blister beetles. Raymond, we're starting to head in towards fall, and one of the things we're still seeing are blister beetles. Yeah, yeah, Jeff, we're still seeing the ash gray blister beetle feeding on eggplant and the three-line blister beetle feeding on chard and other plants. The adults, obviously, are causing the, most of the damage. When you're dealing with blister beetles, one of our recommendations is handpicking. However, you need to wear gloves because they could emit a compound called cantharidin. Cantharidin is a compound that cause blisters, and you don't want that in your skin and your eyes. So if you are going to do hand removal, wear le- leather gloves. Take the adults, put them in a bucket of soapy water, one to ten, and that should kill them. Sometimes that's been more effective than spraying. But they are out there still feeding. Eventually, they'll they'll, uh, they'll start thinking of overwintering. But they are still causing damage on certain vegetable plants. Fall webworm, are we still in the first generation or the second generation? Jeff, we're in the second generation right now. And this is where you start seeing the webs on walnut, hickory, especially if you take the back roads of, of Kansas. Really, there's nothing you need to do because the trees are going to be start thinking in reproductive mode, and they'll be allocating their energy down for the roots. So really, fall webworm, unless the infestations are extremely severe, really doesn't cause much damage or harm to the plant. Unless it's a young plant early on, like a birch, but otherwise, these large walnuts or, or um, other trees 
that are out there that are have the nests on them, there's really going to be no direct or indirect harmful effects. It's one of those things we see just because of how big they can be sometimes. Yeah, the nests can be the nests are quite large and the caterpillars stay in the nests and feed. That's why they're difficult to manage with insecticides because the insecticides can't penetrate the webbing unlike eastern tent caterpillar which will come out, but you can use a high pressure water spray or a rake to dislodge it and then the birds will come in and eat the caterpillars. Yeah, or you can if it's a localized infestation just prune it out and take it to a transfer station or whatever, but that's probably the best way to do with them at this point. One of the things we're probably hearing maybe as much as seeing are cicada killers. Yes, the the dog-faced cicada is still making noise if you're out there, and as a consequence, the cicada killer. Now, let me explain what's going on there because there's people that think these are murder hornets, and they're not. But the female goes up and uh, grabs a cicada and stings it, paralyzes it, brings it back to the nest, and which which is usually in the ground, the turf grass, sandy area, and she provisions that nest with the dead cicada, and that's where she lays her eggs on that dead cicada, and that's what the larva uses the food source. Now, the males are very territorial, and uh, they will hover around and fly around and zip around, and they can't sting because they don't have an ovipositor, but they're very intimidating, and we've had several years on campus we have to put up signs uh, around Waters Hall that uh, these are cicada killer males. They are aggressive, but they're not going to harm you. But again, the murder hornet is not in Kansas as we know right now. The other thing we wanted to touch on today was sanitation, just getting things cleaned up. Yes, as we get near the end of the season, many of the insects we've talked about overwinter and debris, plant material. So removing dead plant material, removing weeds is going to minimize problems uh, next year, hopefully, because you, they won't have any overwintering sites. So uh, removing, again, weeds debris, plant debris is going to be, it's one of the strategies of plant protection to minimize the populations for next year. And then sources and always contacting your extension agents. Yes. uh, We have our extension newsletter. We have extension personnel trained as specialists in entomology. And we're always there to, if you have any questions, contact the business office and they will put you in contact with an entomologist, a trained entomologist to answer any of your questions, whether it be ID uh, an insect or mite pest, or what to do uh, in terms of uh, recommendations for management. That's K-State horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd. Again, for more information on blister beetles, fall webworm infestations, cicada killers, or cleaning up the home landscape, contact your local extension office or visit the Kansas State University Entomology Department website, entomology.k-state.edu. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.